Okay, guys, this is going to be a video on rate equations, okay? More specifically, Arrhenius. This is from an AQA A-Level Chem Pass paper. So hopefully I can help you guys out here if you're struggling a bit with Arrhenius, okay? So I'm just going to jump straight into this. So a second series of experiments was carried out to investigate how the rate of the reaction varies with temperature. Okay, so this is carrying on from a previous question. I actually did that one in a separate video, but essentially the rate constant K will change with temperature, okay? So identical amounts of reagents were mixed at different temperatures. The time taken T for a fixed amount of bromine to be formed was measured at different temperatures. The results are shown in table three. So we have a nice data table here. Um, 5.4 then. Oh, 5.3, complete table three. Okay, I, I completely missed that. So super easy question, guys. Two marks, easiest two marks in the world. Okay, so a lot of students may look at this and think, oh, oh no, I'm going to have to do the graph. I'm going to have to go back and fill these in by reading them off uh, line of best fit or whatever. No. OK, just chuck this in your calculator. So if this temperature is 302, all you have to do is one divided by that temperature. That's your answer right here. OK, next up is our one over T. OK, so this value right here, all you have to do is do the natural log of that in your calculator that easy takes two seconds, all right? So put that in your calculator and you should get these answers, okay? So this first one is gonna be 3.31 times 10 to the minus three. And this next one is gonna be minus 3.3. Okay, not too hard. Let's move on to the next one where things get can get a bit more difficult, okay? So the Arrhenius equation can be written as follows, okay? So you're gonna be, I'm trying to think of how to explain this. So normally you're given a typical Arrhenius equation and then that is transformed to make it easier to interpret for whatever you have to do in the question, okay? So in this experiment, the rate constant K is directly proportional to one over T. Therefore, they've writ rewritten it as this, where C1 and C2 are constants. Use values from table three to plot a graph of ln one over T against one over T on the grid. Use your graph to calculate a value for the activation energy in kilojoules per mole. Activation energy for this reaction, the value of the gas constant R is this. Okay, so for those of you that don't do maths, you may look at this and think, oh no, like you, you might get super intimidated, not have a clue what's going on, panic setting in. Don't panic, okay? What you can see here, hopefully, now... Before I start here, what I want to do is just, if, you, if you're if you really pressed for time, you don't have any time to watch this video, when you see a question like this, all you need to do is equate the equation given. So for example, this is a new one. This isn't in the textbook. They've rewritten this, okay? And then they've rewritten it again in a different format, just with different variables. You want to equate this to the equation of a straight line, y equals mx plus c. Okay, simple as that. I say it's simple. Some people may struggle with this, but essentially our LNK is our Y, our, our activation energy over R negative is our M, so our gradient. One over T is our X, and then we have a constant here plus C, which is our Y intercept. So, and that's just where the uh, the line of best fit is going to cross our Y axis. So if you're not too keen on maths, that, that's, that's what that is there. So, if, you, yeah, if you're pressed for time, just remember this and do your best to try and uh, fit them together. Now, in a typical Arrhenius question, this is actually quite easy because they've laid it out in the exact format, okay? Minus EA over R times one over T. This isn't normally the case, okay? Normally the M and the X are combined into one fraction, okay? So they've made it a lot easier here. Now, this is the Arrhenius equation can be written like this. They have rewritten it as this, and they say, okay, the rate constant K is directly proportional to one over T. So from there, they're telling us that this equation right here is exactly the same as this equation, okay? If they're directly proportional, the ln k, whatever number we put in here is gonna ultimately impact this number in exactly the same way, okay? They have a one-to-one -one relationship. They are directly proportional. So then, what we can do here is just use this equation instead, put our values from our data table here into this, and we can carry out the question in exactly the same way as if they hadn't transformed it, okay? So, like I said, you may see this and think, oh, this wasn't in my notes, I don't know what's going on. 
They're just testing your ability to connect the dots, okay? And that's all they're doing here. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna start with just plotting our axis here, our Y axis, so that we can then plot our data points and do a line of best fit, okay? In all of these questions, you need to do a line of best fit and that will allow us to work out our gradient, okay? The reason for that is because our gradient, our negative activation energy over our gas constant R, has to be rearranged to work to make our activation energy the subject okay all of these questions essentially follow that same sequence so that's what i'm going to do here is look at our y-axis okay so did they tell us what to do here to plot a graph of ln y okay so they've told us exactly what to do really kind of aqa here ln 1 over t so normally in these questions they don't tell you what the axes are okay especially in other exam boards so here they've told us exactly what to do so we have to use this column right here ln 1 over t to be our y-axis and as we can see from the equation of a straight line this is our y just uh, because it's directly proportional to this so hopefully that makes things easy now, the area where people struggle the most, well, not struggle the most, but struggle a decent amount with graphical questions is working out, okay, what the hell is my scale going to be? So always keep in mind that if you if they give you a specific amount of graph paper, they need you to fill that graph paper out, okay? They will penalize the hell out of you if you only fill up like half of the graph, okay? They really don't like that. So what you want to do is look at, okay, what is the range in my values here? How can I spread this out in an even amount so that I fill up as much of the graph as possible, okay? So what I'm going to do here is we've got a spread from minus 2.08 to minus 3.99, okay? So that's a spread of roughly minus two. So that's exactly what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna count up my squares here. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Perfect, okay? So we've got a spread of roughly minus two. I'm gonna separate these out by minus 2.4 per big square. Hopefully that makes sense to you guys. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna fill this in real quickly, come back and we'll be plotting our data and doing our line of best fit. Okay guys, so I've gone ahead and put in our values from the data table on our nice axis here. And exactly like I said, I separated the big squares by nor minus 0 0.2 each, okay? So, and also very important, I labeled my axis, okay? So ln one over t was our y axis. Make sure you label that, okay, to get full marks. Really wanna label that up to six mark question, okay? So pretty simple. Hopefully you guys are okay with that. Just look at the range of your values. Look at how many big squares you have on your scale and that will determine what scale you use essentially. Okay. And just really remember that to fill up the entire graph paper or as much of it as possible. Okay, so I've gone ahead, I've plotted all my four data points here, and then I just drew a line of best fit through them as well as possible, okay? So with AQA, they allow the line of best fit to be plus or minus one small square away from the data point. So on the computer, it's a bit difficult to do this, but hopefully in your exam, it's a lot easier. So then, what we have to do now is we have to find our gradient. In all these questions, the gradient is the most important thing. So... M is our gradient here, okay? All that is, is our change in Y over our change in X, okay? And now the equation I use for this is our, our uh, coordinate Y2 minus our coordinate Y1 over our coordinate X2 minus our coordinate X1. So if we pick a point on Y2 and Y1, you can essentially pick any point you want here. I said this in other videos, but you really want to try and make your data spread for the gradient a decent amount, okay? You don't have to do it like all the way across. That's essentially what I picked, okay? I picked a data point here and a data point here to, to make our gradient. You don't have to do that, okay? As long as it's not like super close together, completely fine. Now, the reason for this is because if you pick two points that are decently far apart, you're gonna get a more accurate representation of the gradient because your data, data range is larger, okay? Now, AQA is quite lenient, with this they quite allow a whole range of different gradients so you should be fine there now like i said the y2 point i picked our two opposite ends of this line of best fit so for y2 i just picked the minus four right here so minus four and then i'm going to minus that from our y1 coordinate which i picked as to be the minus two okay minus two now you can pick any point you want. So you don't have to make this one the Y2. You can make this one the Y2 and this one the Y1. You just have to make sure that whatever you choose is your Y2 and your Y1, you match it up with the correct points on the X axis, okay? That's essentially how it works. Now, 
minus four is all the way down here. So if I scale that up to the x-axis, my point is right here, okay? Now, I probably didn't pick the, mo the best points here because I should have probably picked a point that was actually on one of these lines. So yeah, keep that in mind because this is gonna add extra work for me here where I have to work out the scale between here and then add up all of these mini squares <laughs> I've come this far, I might as well just carry on. But yeah, essentially, you want to try and pick an easy point on this graph, okay? So, if this is separated by how many squares do we have here? 5, 10, okay, we've got 20 square, mini square difference between these two data points. So that is a 0.1 difference times 10 to the minus 3. If I divide that by 20, it's going to give us a difference of 0 0.005 times 10 to the minus 3, okay, for each of these mini squares. So I'm gonna, <laughs> like I said, long-winded, I probably picked the poor point here. Um, so I'm going to minus that from this value right here. So from minus 4, our x-axis is going to be minus 3.495 times 10 to the minus 3, okay, long-winded, but oh well. So our next point here is a lot easier, okay? Minus two goes straight through this point. So it's gonna be 3.2 times 10 to the minus three. Okay, 3.20 times 10 to the minus three. All right, that's out of the way. Now, you don't have to be super perfect with these points, okay? Um, the, like I said, they allow quite a range. So if you get if you get a little bit off in terms of where you're reading off of it, completely fine, okay? Just make sure you match up the points to make sure the gradient is as accurate as possible. So if you chuck this into your calculator, you're gonna get a value of minus 6,779.66, okay? Now, obviously, you're gonna get a different gradient to me based on what you did here, okay? And that's gonna be completely fine. Okay, so really important to note here, okay, what are our units? Now, they don't require this during the calculation stage um, when you're showing your working, but I just want to explain it to you guys, okay? So we have a value here, L ln 1 over t, no units, all right? And that is divided by, so when you have a graph, y over x is essentially how it works because we're doing y over x, okay? So if we have no units here, so I'm just going to leave that as blank, right? And if we have 1 over t here, so essentially this is 1 over k, 1 over Kelvin, right? Now, if we have nothing um, over 1 over Kelvin, essentially this can be thought of as 1, okay, because there's no units. It's essentially going to flip this over, so it's not going to be per Kelvin, it's just going to be Kelvin as our units. So I'm going to actually make a note of that here. That will allow me to explain the next stage, okay? So this is our gradient. What do you do? What are we going to do here then? So Ultimately, what we want to do is if this collectively is our gradient, we want to be able to transform this to make activation energy, the subject, which is the guy that we're looking for. And we need it to be in kilojoules per mole. Okay, that's really important. So in these questions, the energy value always has to be consistent. So as we can see here, within our gas constant, we've got an energy value of joules. Okay, and the, the rest of the units don't really matter here, but that, that's what we've got there. But they want our activation energy units to be in kilojoules per something, okay? So what ultimately, we have to make sure these are consistent. So during our calculations, just really pay attention to your energy units. All right, so I moved everything up a bit because I was running out of space. But essentially, if I write this out here, if we have our gradient equals minus activation energy over R, and we want to make this a subject, all we do is gonna times both sides by R. So if we transform this to make activation energy the subject, it's gonna be M times R, okay? And then we ultimately want this positive, so we're going to chuck a negative in front of all of that. Easy peasy, okay? And that's exactly what we're going to do here. So activation energy equals. Now, what is our gradient here? Our gradient was minus 6779.66, okay? But that is Kelvin. Now, we don't need to take that into account here, but I'm going to use it to explain a couple of things. So if we have that, we're going to make that positive because if this a negative becomes a negative, it's going to be a positive. So I'm going to put that as 6,779.66, okay? Now, what we're going to do here is times it by our gas constant, 8.31, okay? Now, when you're doing units, this Kelvin, per Kelvin, that's just going to cancel and we're going to be left with joules per mole, okay? And that's really important to note here because if that, if that gives us an answer in joules per mole and we want it in kilojoules per mole, all you have to do is divide by a thousand. Hopefully that makes sense to you guys. So if I do that here and I put that in my calculator, we're going to get an answer of 56,338.9. Point nine seven joules per mole. Okay, we don't want that. We want it in kilojoules. And it's going to give us 
kilojoules per mole and that is to three significant figures okay and that's our answer right there six marks in the bag so guys, that's the end of the video. Hopefully you found it helpful. It may have been a bit rushed. I'm sure I probably could have picked better points on the graph. But oh well, we got this far. We might as well just get it out for you guys so you can understand the process, okay? So subscribe for future maths and science content. Best of luck in your exams, guys. Peace.